All right, everyone. So today is our fourth day of our advanced Google class. And if you have your syllabus, we've been uh, going through all of these concepts. We talked about Google Plus the first day. We talked about YouTube the second. We talked about Google Webmaster Tools the third. All of these advanced Google features. We're going to look at one that you probably have some experience in, but we'll look at it in the more advanced ways. For today, uh, my plan is to look at setting up Google Drive its online and offline versions uh, and uh, for mobile as well and then uh, for creating collaborative documents we'll see what that's about and creating forms not forums forms so feedback forms all of this is tied into our Google account so what we'll do is go ahead and open your web browser And then you can go to the address drive.google.com. This used to be called Google Docs. Basically, Google Drive is one of the many offerings out there for cloud storage. Uh, so you hear that buzzword a lot. Uh, the cloud, that's just another term for the internet. Uh, legend has it that they chose that name because on so many meetings at so many tech companies when they were doing presentations and they had their whiteboard and they were planning out their projects and they said our, our app will connect to the internet and the internet was often drawn as a cloud. Mm -hmm. So now it's cloud, the cloud, cloud computing. It just means any internet enabled or internet connected app or service or website or whatever, the cloud. Um, and so what this is, a safe place for all your files. And uh, you can scroll down just to get a, uh, some spiel here. Store any file. Drive starts you with 15 gigabytes of free Google Online storage. So you can keep photos, stories, designs, etc. So this is like your flash drive on the internet. Uh, you've got this flash drive that holds 8 gigabytes, 2 gigabytes, 16 gigabytes, a terabyte, whatever. You've got these little flash drives that hold so much information. And they're amazing until you lose it. And you lose a lot of information. This is the thing that uh, I give people advice. Don't buy the biggest flash drive you can. I think it's too much of a liability that if it fails, you've lost a lot of data. If you lose it, you've lost a lot of data. Um, so any size of a flash drive is good, but the big failure point is that it's a physical thing. These cloud storage solutions like Google Drive um, allow you to save any kind of file onto your free account online in the cloud. What's cool about that is then you can access it from any computer. There's been a lot of times that I have some sort of lesson or handouts or something saved on my home computer, and I forget, I forget to bring the latest version of it on my flash drive. So well, I just come here, I log on to my drive, and then I download the latest version because it's synchronized. Yes? Do you ever like, have any worry about anyone's cloud? Like if it goes down or something? Yeah, that's one of the big things to talk about, that there's so many positives, which let me finish with those, and then we'll talk about some negatives. Uh, so this will work on your laptop, tablet, smartphone. Um, Android or iPhone or, or Windows, basically. It's universal. We'll talk about sharing, creating collaborative documents. You can make folders, all of that, get started. So uh, how many of you have heard of Google Drive or Google Docs before this class? Okay. How many of you have heard of any other um, competitors? Dropbox. Dropbox, yes. That's the other one. Exactly. There's Dropbox. There's also, not Dropbox, Dropbox. There's also Box. Any other ones? Um, iCloud. iCloud, yeah. That's another one. Yeah, OneDrive, exactly. So those are some of the big ones. Uh, there's some other ones. There's, the, there's like the bad boy of the group, which is Mega. <laughs> <coughs> Long story why it's the bad boy. But um, those are the, 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 and then of course Google. So those are, there's lots of cloud solutions. 
They're all in competition with each other. I remember when these were new that they would offer like the first one that offered you one gigabyte. I was like, wow, that's the king. <laughs> and now right here Google is giving you 15 gigabytes for free. Dropbox, to my knowledge, is still the old school one in that it only gives you two gigabytes to start off with, but through referrals and other techniques you can you can get more. I believe at the moment I've got like 19 gigabytes. So yeah, I've pestered a lot of people to use my link on Dropbox and I've got 19 gigabytes. Here, um, uh, Google gives you 15 to start off with, and uh, Microsoft's OneDrive, that one also started off with 15. Unfortunately, they did a really weird move that everyone was like, you guys are dumb. OneDrive gave away 15 gigabytes to start off with, and then last year they said, we're going to cut everyone's space down to 5 gigabytes because people are abusing it. People said, 99% of us are not abusing it, and you're taking it away from 100% of us. So they relented, and they said, if you currently have a drive, we're sorry, just just confirm that you're that you have this drive and, we'll, and you'll keep your gigabytes okay that's good but you if you're gonna create a brand new account you're gonna get five gigabytes so it doesn't make sense that strategy um, all of these are in competition with each other iCloud also it's been pretty bad throughout the years it works really well with your iPhone and such but it's it's so limited compared to the other ones yes I heard Amazon's also yeah, Amazon has a couple of ones, but they're really more about, yeah, Amazon, Amazon's weird, because for people, it's very limited. I believe it gives you like 200 megabytes. Wow. So for people, it's really small, because they want you to pay for their service, and it's like $2 a month. And it's not so bad, but all of these offer free and paid services, and the free ones usually are working really well. And then with paid, you can get even more. Like, you know, $10 a month will give you 50 gigabytes of space. And um, accessible anywhere and very useful. But there's downsides, of course. If you don't have internet access at that moment, you can't access your files. If the Wi Fi here is terrible, or if the reception of my phone is terrible, or you know, a squirrel bites through the cable in the data center, I don't have access to my files. I need an internet connection. That's one of the big downsides, you might say. You need internet access to access your internet files. The other aspect, negativity to think about, is privacy and security. Because you are putting all of your files, if you, if you go that far, you're putting all your valuable files on someone else's server, a big corporation server. And they're in the business to sell you products and such, but also built on customer trust. And if they get hacked, if, if they have NSA backdoors, if, if there's some vulnerability, people are not going to feel safe putting their data on these cloud services. And we're in a point in time very interesting uh, and daunting because we as a people seem to want the most convenience possible these things are super convenient but are they the most secure are they the most safe are they the most privacy enabled and these things are still being figured out so if you're not comfortable putting your personal files there of course don't use them um, the um, that might be a big negative for, for most people, but I use them. I have an account with almost all of them, and I use them a lot. And I don't put my most sensitive things there, but I have, like, for example, my automatic photo uploads. Uh, I've got it so when I take a photo, it automatically backs up to my cloud account. So the good news about that is, well, if I lose my phone or I drop it in the lake, my photos have hopefully been uploaded to my account, and they're there. <coughs> they're safe there, at least. Of course, the downside is if I take an embarrassing photo, it's also there, and then extrapolating it out, if someone hacks my account, there's my embarrassing photo. But these are all of the things we have to think about when it, in this new world of, of technology, balancing privacy and security, convenience and security. It can be kind of complex. But we're going to be positive, and we're going to say that these cloud solutions are... are are good. They're they're useful. They're convenient. They're secure because Google and Microsoft and Apple uh, 
they they know that they have to create a good product for people because people are you know their customers and so they have to have a secure product and um, we're gonna we're gonna take them as at face value and you may or may not but uh, for the pur purposes of this class we're going to use this and then again you can decide if, if it's for you or not you can delete it no harm no foul and so uh, what we'll do here is we'll go to drive.google.com and we will sign in in a moment. But any, any questions at this point? Are there stories of security issues? I haven't heard that many with, with these. I hear them all the time with email accounts and with retailers and that sort of thing. But these are set up to be like the most secure because they've got so much secure data and there's always the specter of the are these companies even though they say it to our faces but behind our backs are they actually collaborating with governments or you know secret agencies to put you know back doors which is like you know a skeleton key to the data are they doing it they say that they're not they say that they're in it for the customers I don't know if anything will be revealed in the coming years or decades, who knows, but um, that's one of the big questions that you have to decide for yourself. Um, is, it, is, it, is it a problem or not? Yes? When I my last company was a university company I worked for, and they weren't allowed to use any of these services because they felt that there had to be like technicians who had access to the data back, so they didn't want anyone outside of the University to have access to the data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, you're putting your you're putting a lot of valuable information in the hands of someone else, of a third party. Mm -hmm. And technically, every company that exists in a country has to follow the rules of that country. Um, these big American companies have had a lot of trouble getting into the Chinese market because the Chinese market has to, you, if you're in the Chinese market, you have to deal with the Chinese government, and the Chinese government is complicated. And so, um, every company has its own jurisdictions. There's a lot of stories about like, you know, uh, having some of these corporations, they have their money in, in offshore accounts because it's better for them financially to be in another country where they don't have to pay taxes here and all of this complication. Mm -hmm. I, I've had, I, ha I do remember hearing some story recently about, in the last couple of years, uh, Microsoft was fighting uh, various US government um, requests to turn over information from Hotmail and they said no we are gonna do privacy and uh, you need a warrant and all of that so all of these companies have that tightrope that they have to balance they exist in a country they have to follow the country's laws but then there's still the values of privacy and, and security so this is all shaking out and all the forces are against each other privacy versus security but again we'll, we'll keep it positive and we'll see it all works out really nice and uh, if you don't agree with it, you, you not use it, and there's no problem. Um, so let's click on Go to Google Drive. This is uh, drive.google.com. And click Go to Google Drive. It'll ask you to sign in. Now, you might notice that when I'm signing in, I put in my password, and then it asks me for an extra password. If you haven't noticed that, you'll see it right now, but I'm going to bring that up because this is one of the ways that you can be even more secure. Let me show you here. Let me turn off the recorder, but let me show you what I'm talking about. I put in my email address. I put in my password. And then there's an extra step, a third step, before I can actually log in. It's asking for a verification code. This is an extra step in security in that let's say someone knows your email address and someone guesses your password. <coughs> then they're going to get to this third step. Okay, now put in the one-time random password that is generated at this moment to really get in, to really confirm it's you. So I'll talk, I'll talk about how to set this up, but this is known as two-factor verification or two-step verification. It's got different names. 
but I have this app connected to my various accounts that randomly generates six-digit numbers every time I try to log in. And so if someone does get to this point and they start putting in random numbers, yeah, today's number is this. No, nope, wrong. And at a certain amount of times, if you do it wrong too many times, the account is locked. But right now it's giving me a random number, and even if you see that my random number right now is this, it's going to change in 10 seconds. So then I'm into my files. I'll talk about setting that up. R remind me a bit later, but that's... Um, that's the, um, it's known as two-factor authentication, two-step verification, different kinds of names, but it's an extra step besides a password, where that's where a lot of failure points happen with security. Uh, they release every year these examples of, of um, the, top, the top 10 worst passwords of the year. And so many times it's the same ones over and over. People are lazy and they write password. Or they write password one, two, three. No one will ever think of that one. Or, you know, their their own last name or their or their dog's name or, or their kids', kids birthdays <laughs> and these clever things that for you were clever, but for a computer, computers are designed to create to carry out repetitive tasks very fast. It can process and break passwords in seconds. Uh, like a five-digit long password can be broken in like, you know, one minute. It can think of all possibilities of five digits. And even when you go to six digits, seven digits, eight digits, if you have a long enough time, any computer can be programmed to crack a password, to break a password. So with that extra two-factor, well, it's random numbers tied to tied to my phone, and so that's much harder to break into. And the thing about all of this online stuff, all of this cloud stuff, is there's really a big push and pull, a big balance act, balancing act between security and convenience. If you want something very convenient, it's not going to be secure. If you just, for example, go home and click your link to go to your bank and you're automatically in, that's so convenient and so unsecure. Because if you lose that laptop, a person just has to go to your bank because you've got it bookmarked and they're into your money. Super convenient, super insecure. On the opposite side, well, maybe you thought of a 20-digit of a long password and it's all random. Very secure because then no one else is going to be able to break that password easily. Um, Let's say when on your own personal computer you log into an account, but you never save the password. You always log in anonymously. That's super secure, but super inconvenient, because then I forgot my password again. I have to reset it. I'm tired of it. Let me set a simple password. Again, uh, convenient, insecure. But if you're going to go secure, it's going to be inconvenient. It's very hard to get a balance of the two, because once it tips a little bit more to, to convenient, it's more insecure. I, for myself personally, I go for the security, which means my things are very inconvenient. You just saw there. Every time I need to log into almost any of my services, I have to do the random code because I'm in public a lot and I use a lot of public computers. So I have that extra inconvenience. Even on my own home computer, my own laptop, uh, I don't click the save my password. I always type it in every time. Um, and even I'm at the level where I have a different password for every service. I have a system where I develop a different password for every website that I go to. And that sounds very inconvenient, and it is, but I have a system and it works. But I believe it's much more secure. And when we're talking about your photos or your documents and such, I think that's a good trade-off, more security for less convenience. And I'll say here also regarding that issue, cybersecurity, um, if you ever, let me give you some a bit of advice here. If you ever need to, because um, I'm a web developer and, and we make p websites for people and we have to create a lot of passwords. We have to give the client those passwords. We never send passwords through email. Email is not secure. Email basically is flying through the air naked. Everything that's in it by default is not secure. So if you're sending people passwords through email, you know, there's, a, there's, there's not a zero possibility that someone's going to steal your data, but having a non-zero possibility is too high for me. 
So never send passwords through email. Ways around it are, of course, send them a letter. That's that, of course, someone could reach into the mailbox and take it. But another way is actually a lot of these instant messaging apps on our devices are pretty secure. WhatsApp and uh, Apple Messaging and uh, what are the other ones? Line and Viber and such. All of those are very secure. You might not think about it, but that's a way. That's how we do it. We communicate with the client via one of these apps, which as far as we can do, it's secure. Now, of course, if the client has no lock, because I've also got a lock on my phone here, if they have no lock and then they lose their phone, well, now they have access to everything. There's only a, so much security that you can put in from your end, but if you're dealing with sensitive information, transmit it through these secure apps. WhatsApp, iMessage, uh, Line, etc. Not email. What I'll also say is public Wi-Fi. Uh, avoid it. And you're all probably right now, especially if you're on your laptop, you're on public Wi-Fi. You're on our Wi-Fi right here for free. You say, well, you've got a password. That's secure, right? No, that's only to let you use our Wi-Fi. That doesn't really encrypt or, or save anything of your, of your files. So I use it too. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm on the public Wi-Fi here. But what I'm saying is public Wi-Fi, especially at Starbucks or McDonald's or wherever they get free Wi-Fi, do you ever notice that you go to these places, there's always someone in the corner there. They've got one cup of coffee and they're on their laptops. What are they doing there? Worst case scenario is they're, they're monitoring the traffic that's going around that we're all getting into there for free. So on that, the answer to that is don't use public Wi-Fi. Very inconvenient very secure. I need to access my expense report at Starbucks and I don't have my little personal cloud thing. So I'll get into Starbucks. Very convenient, very insecure. Here's how to deal with that. You need to, this is a little off topic from Google here, but you need what is known as a VPN. A VPN is a virtual private network. It's software that creates a secure internet connection wherever you're at. Even on the most public, unpassword protected Wi Fi network, your connection to that Wi Fi network will be secured as it travels through the insecure network. Most of these VPNs are not free, obviously, because this takes time and money to set up to be secure. And prices range a lot dozens of dollars to hundreds of dollars to thousands of dollars. Sometimes your employer has a VPN as part of your employment. Check with IT. You might have some sort of VPN that you can tap into to be safe. And especially if you're dealing with tech companies, they're going to say, make sure you're on your VPN all the time. And that simply means that you're running the VPN software on your phone or computer. I'm going to recommend one here that I've been using for, for a little while now, and I like it, and it's affordable, and it seems to work really well. Called Surf Easy. Surf Easy. It comes from the company Opera, actually. Is, it, is there a browser still? Yeah. yeah. It's a little red O. And so Surf Easy it says try it for free, but right away you're going to see it's really useful. It works on Windows, it works on Macs, it works on iPhones and Androids, and <coughs> everything basically, web browsers. And uh, it's, it's, this little, uh, it's this little unobtrusive app. You turn it on, you're going to get a little green shield in the corner here, and that means that your traffic is secure. Even if you connect to the most insecure password, I mean, insecure Wi-Fi network out there, it's going to encrypt your traffic first before sending it insecure. Even if you're at home, do you use VPN at home? Not really at home. That's an extra level of uh, paranoia. I mean, privacy. <laughs> but it could be useful at home because what it also has is a built-in uh, ad blockers, too. Uh, and also... Uh, do you see here? It says it had it has already blocked 301, you know, 
in a week or whatever, 301 like little spam ads that were going to bother you. So yeah, you could use it at home too if you if you don't want to see the spam when you're browsing. So is it, a, like if you have it on a PC, is it something you have to log on or you just try, it's something you download and it's there? You download it and you log on one time and then it's just going to be running and that's it. And uh, it's PC or Mac, and what the cool thing is that you you buy your license per year. I think it's like fifty dollars per year, which is very good for security. And you can install it to five devices. Nice. Some are that you buy one license for one device, fifty dollars a month, let's say, and then you have to keep buying it for every device. So you've probably got five devices: your phone, your laptop, your spouse's phone or laptop. And so you've got all those devices tied to the same account, and they're uh, all encrypted and secure, ad tracker removal. So all of those cookies and such that accumulate while you browse the web, those will also be securely dealt with. And then here's the highest level. They sell also a little USB drive that is super encrypted. You plug it into any public computer, and it gives you the encrypted secure channel with an encrypted secure web browser and such. Um, so that's for if you need to go to other people's computers or the library and such. Um, public computers, you have like a physical device there for security. Yes? Are you currently looking to buy for something outside my list for my PC? Mm -hmm. So if, um, I don't know, if I internet Maybe not, um, but there's so so much competition in this in this field now, which is the best one. So, to give you the best answer, I would look at Surf Easy and look at its you know look at its benefits. And look look at what it offers and compare that with the one you're getting from the other one. And if this one offers you more, then this is the better one. If the other one is comparable, then you only have to pay for one, not both. Because um, it's not really a good idea to run two VPN software at once. That causes conflicts. And uh, I don't get any sort of kickback or anything from them. I just uh, want to mention them because they are very useful. They have been very useful. Uh, for me, and um, on, a, on a side note, um, this also has a uh, region. It, it also makes you anonymous because uh, when we looked at Google Webmaster and such, uh, we saw there that it gathers all of this data about your location. We we're broadcasting all that location. This will uh, will change your location. It won't say you're coming from San Diego, it'll say you're coming from Kansas. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you want that level of security, it does that also. And sometimes, have you ever run into anything where you're trying to watch some YouTube video or something, but it says, sorry, this video is not available in your region. Um, other countries experience that a lot. We have so much great content in the US, but then they're in Canada and they can't watch it even though the US is 10 miles away. It's just a different region. So here you can do that. Uh, I have a friend who uh, she was recon re reconnecting with her youth and wanting to watch soap operas from Argentina uh, that you can't get in the US. But using this, changing the region down to Brazil, let her see those old soap operas that you can't see in the US. So um, just some extra features of this. There's a lot of competitors. You might already know one and use it, and, and great. Uh, I, I did some research, and I was on the fence for a long time, which I wanted to invest in. And then I looked into this one, and I saw how useful and affordable and powerful it was. So that's the one I went with. Does anyone have any opinion or any insight into any other VPNs you might have heard of? No, but I do have a question. Does this um, mean anything like slow down or Negligible, so not really. I don't really notice it. Um, I have it running all the time, and I really haven't felt that it was detrimental speed-wise. Thanks for the recommendation. Yeah, I was using the IP vanish, and it ran real slow. 
Oh, I did it. Was it and what what, a, what was its price structure? Um, it started off I think it was like ten a month or something, mm -hmm. and then it was uh, sixty for the year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, give this one a try and see if it works better. There is that free trial. I think it works for maybe seven days, yeah, maybe yeah. two weeks or so. Let's see. Let's um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure they might. So the price is here somewhere. Yeah. And so there's a lot of options out there. The thing about this being a third-party app that it's not it's it's independent in that it's not powered by Microsoft or Google or Apple. So there's something to be said about that. Well, obviously the, the higher levels of paranoia. If I get the Google VPN, am I really secure? Or are they actually going to send me ads? If I get the Microsoft VPN, are they really secure? Or are they going to look at my email? Well, they're all like this. There's this to think about for all of them, but. Well, this is a third-party independent company, so that might, that might be a use there. That's I a, use um, Advanced, their Envers, mm -hmm. and they have their own VPN too. Yeah, there, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them competing, definitely. And honestly, the more, usually, the more one pays, the more better it is. Um, and so there's several of them out there that are also free, but from my research and, and reviews that I've read, you get what you pay for. It's not the best. What I tried to do for a long time, because this concept of VPN, actually, you can, you can roll your own, meaning if you've got a server, you can set it up on a server. And I've got a server in my closet. So I, I had that for a little while, but it's so inconvenient, because when you get to this level of doing it yourself, it's like, are you going to buy a car or build it yourself? And I was building the car myself. And I don't have time for that anymore. So going with these, these pre-made ones are so often better. Everything. Yeah, keeping up to date with everything. So any last questions before we get back to the topic at hand? Uh, so that's a little bit of sidebar on security. So here with Google Drive, what we've got is um, basically a, a place for you to save your files. We have a, a few different ways to use it. We logged into the website, and so let's say I wanted to save one of my files. I've got, just as an example here, I've got some pictures I've got some valuable pictures that I shot when I went to Australia and when I went to Antarctica and to England. Um, I've got these pictures that I want to save. And I've got Google Drive. So if I had never saved my files from my computer to my drive and my computer fails, I lost them. One way to back them up is to simply, from my computer, drag them into Google Drive. Uh, you, okay, I guess you have to upload like that. Add new files. New. Um, I'm used to the one on one drive where you can just drag it. Okay. Google says no. No. So I have, okay, I can call new file up. I can upload a file, I can upload a whole folder. I might have a whole folder of, of pictures that I want to upload. So just for practice here, on the left side, click New and click File Upload. We're going to borrow one of these sample pictures in our computer. When the file open box appears on the left pane, scroll to the top and you will see Pictures and then Sample Pictures. So I'm adding a new file to my Google Drive, I'm uploading a picture on my local computer. So under the Pictures library on the left, then I've got Sample Pictures and just pick 
any one picture. You can select multiple pictures, but I'm just going to select one picture, jellyfish. Click open. One of the other downsides of all of this system, of course, of cloud storage is the speed of your internet. Because all of these companies, AT&T, Cox, Time Warner, whatever, they're all in competition with each other to offer you services, especially with internet, to offer you um, internet speeds. Although, comparatively with the rest of the world, the internet in the US is one of the worst ones, shockingly, for such a developed nation. South Korea has one of the best internets in the world. Really? South Korea. So here, um, for a long time, for example, the speed, the average speed of of, of internet connections uh, in the U.S. was like five megabits upload speeds. And now at Cox, um, my parents have the fifty gigabyte one. They don't need it, but they have the fifty gigabyte upload speeds. Um, at my place I've got 15, my other friend has 50, so yeah, there's these upload speeds that are getting way better. Still, in South Korea, getting 100, 100 megabytes upload speed, that's the basic. And for here, it's like, that's you're paying like $200 a month. Yeah. None of them. They're all terrible. They're all terrible. They're all monopolies. That's exactly what I was going to say. You're going to get all these great download speeds, but then your upload speeds are going to be terrible. Even with the 50 gigabyte uploads, 50 megabyte megabit upload speed, you're going to get 5 megabytes upload. So, you don't like anybody though? They're all terrible. He's going to start his own ISP soon. I had them for a long time time at my old place and uh, yeah they were okay and then from okay to horrible and I've moved to a new place and I'm using Cox and they're they're fine they're all the same they're all gonna gouge you and they're all gonna raise their price little by little and they're all gonna collude with each other that's that they're gonna raise their prices and lower their speeds uh, until an act of Congress gets them in order but you know how Congress is at the moment so any one of these that's gonna be the big bottleneck upload because let's say I do get the 50 gigabyte plan from Google. Great, I can upload all of my stuff, and you'll be waiting a few days for it all to upload. Because oftentimes our upload speeds are much slower on residential internet. Here we've got good speeds. We've got like 30 megabyte up megabits upload, and, and we can get on a good day like 60 megabytes downloads and such. At Southwestern College, they just updated everything. They have gigabit Ethernet there now, so that's 1,000 megabits upload and download. Uh, so well, the first time I saw that, um, like, is that for real? Am I really downloading something 500 megabits at, a, at per second? That's like uh, crazy speeds. That's like South Korea speeds. So this file uploaded, it told me right here, it was less than one megabyte. It uploaded pretty fast. That's one picture, but if I took a bunch of photos of my deep sea diving and they're all in raw format, with each one being five megabytes, five times 50 pictures, I've got a lot to upload, and if my upload speed isn't very good, I suddenly find this very inconvenient. But this is one way to use it. I'm uploading a file from my desktop. There's also the version that's more convenient, but we can't really do it here, which is get drive for PC. What this is, is you don't have to do this, but if, if you follow that link, it's going to give you a download, it's going to give you an app that you're going to download and install to your computer, Windows or Mac, or your iPhone, or your Android phone. It's going to download an app, install a special folder on your computer, It'll behave like a regular folder that you've always seen, but this is synchronized, and the animation here is showing. You've got your computer, you're going to upload, you're going to move files to this folder, this Google folder, and then it will automatically, behind the scenes, upload everything, and it'll show up on your cloud drive or your devices. That's usually how I use these things. I've got my Google Drive or my Dropbox or my OneDrive, all of them actually running at the same time, and then I save a file into those folders, and it just behind the scenes is uploading. And then before I know it, my files are up on my cloud drives, and then I can access them on the go on my devices. 
So this one would be very useful if you're if you're forgetful about doing backups, because that's another thing that everyone needs to do, but no one does. Back up your stuff. Your whole life is on these computers, on these phones, and when it fails, it's tragic doubly because your device failed, but you lost so much stuff. You lost your family photos, you lost your tax returns, you lost uh, all of these important things in your life because they're digital. You don't think about them as a real physical thing. Of course I've got my wedding photo album right here. It's safe in, in, the, in the safe. But here you've got so much stuff. You lose this or your laptop. You lost years of information, of memories. If you've got one of these cloud solutions, you've got this little folder hanging out on your computer. You just save stuff to that folder and it uploads. It's safe. The computer itself breaks, gets stolen or whatever. Uh, your stuff is safe in the cloud. So we put the, the standard live drive. Basically, it sits on the desktop, right? You cannot create a folder. No, it should let you create a folder where you'd like. The, the default could be that you get it on your desktop, yes. But it is going to be a folder when you install it. There's usually basic installation and advanced installation. If you, if you look at the advanced installation, usually that's where you can choose where to put it if you don't want it cluttering the desktop. Um, so of course then there's also the version for your device and those are also very cool because I definitely use it uh, I have I have OneDrive uh, from Microsoft same thing as Google Drive but I've got mine where I've got my OneDrive account the app is on all my devices I take a photo and the photo automatically backs up to my drive here all I need is internet access which this thing always has and then my photos get backed up to the cloud and if I lose this I've got all my photos in the cloud and uh, it's so convenient because then it's even more convenient for my mom because you know she has one of these smartphones and it's still a challenge to get her photos off of her uh, phone to her computer. Well, I set it up on on OneDrive that simply she takes a photo, she walks to her computer, and it shows up there because it's all connected and convenient in that in that account. Yeah, that's how I have my Google Drive. Yeah. Every time I take a picture, that and Dropbox I do. Yeah, double secure. With iCloud, yeah. So they, they definitely, all of these are in competition, all of them offer the same services basically, and they're all, uh, they all could be very good. So we can upload files on the website, we can install the software. Okay, we can upload files, great. That's good for, for, for backing up existing files and such. We'll see right after a break. We also have another way to use this, which is for creating files, and then we'll see about sharing files, because I have all of these files, all of these great photos, and how do I get Aunt Gertrude to go see my photo? I can actually share files or folders privately, as we'll see right after the break. Any general questions? Okay, it's 10.30. Let's take a 10-minute break. When we come back, we'll, we'll look at uh, other aspects of Google Drive. <laughs>